make things work. I'm in the wrong. Everybody say hi so she'll leave me alone. Hi. Pretty cat. Okay. You happy now? All right. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> No, you're not gonna leave me alone, are you? Okay, that's what I thought. Do we know if um, Alandis is joining us this evening? I have not heard anything. Um, and can you, would you mind uh, unmuting the call in user just so we can check who that is? Um, I think it's Aaron. That should oh. be um, would you mind uh, unmu unmuting him? Oh, we have multiple. Oh. Okay, you broke you broke up a little bit, Grace. Can you say it again? Oh yeah, no problem. Um, would you mind unmuting the call-in users? I think you said one was Aaron. I'm using my computer audio. I'm not on my phone. Oh. Okay, is I'm I don't know if I'm having bad connection or if it's great. But I cannot hear you. I see it's calling users on the line, if that's what you're saying. And I can unmute them if you would like me to. Yeah, if you don't mind. That's what you said. Okay, okay. I will do that. They are awesome. <laughs> um, uh, hey, Grace, I'm one of the call-in users. It's Ian Myers. Oh, hey, Ian. <laughs> Hi. Um, you should be able to, to mute on your end if you want, but we'll just leave you unmuted in case you, you need to chime in. All right. Um, and call in user uh, 646-346. Yes. Hi, I'm Kim Lanier. I'm just joining to listen to the discussion. But I'm Wonderful. Gonna well, Thank wonderful. You. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Paula, I think it is um, all you then. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's get this meeting started. <clears throat> Are we recording? Uh, yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, today the Arts Commission Committee for Anti-Racism and Equity and Metro Arts staff are joining by conference call. In a moment, we will call roll of all members present. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available to the public no later than 48 hours after. Any action items decided by consensus at today's meeting will be reconfirmed at the next in-person meeting of the committee. So I am going to call the meeting to order. As I am taking roll call, we will bring up the care group norms on the screen as well. For each committee member, I will ask your name. Are you present? And if you would say yay. Aaron? Yay. Ellen? Yay. John? Yay. Jonathan? Yay. Megan? Yay. Ms. Bounce? I'll get it right one day. Yep, Sarah. Yay. And then Terry? Yay. Fantastic. Thank you. I will now call for a motion that the meeting agenda constitutes essential business of this body and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans considering the COVID-19 outbreak and is permitted under the governor's executive order number 71. I will need someone to propose a motion to this effect. Okay, is there a second? This is Jonathan. Fantastic. Thank you, Terry and Jonathan. Um, 
If anyone has any comments on this motion, please raise your hand. All right, seeing no comments, um, we'll do another roll call vote. <clears throat> and if you will state whether you agree or not, Aaron. I agree. Okay. Ellen. Agree. John. Agree. Jonathan. Megan. Agree. Miss Bounce. Agree. And Terry. Agree. Uh, Ellen, did I miss you? I'm sorry. No, I agreed. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the motion passes. And now I will pass the meeting to Ms. Spence to facilitate our information session. Awesome. Great. Um, I was hoping I could get control uh, or become a host, if that's possible. I just wanted to share my screen and show a short yeah. video. Yeah. Kenya, would you mind uh, making Sara bounce the um, presenter? Thank you. Yay, awesome. Okay, so um, I'm really excited. I feel like um, watching art and watching uh, something together um, helps us kind of facilitate a dialogue about things that maybe um, are just more challenging for us to notice or, you know, things that we've just, we see all the time. Um, and so I wanted to show just like a really, really brief clip from a movie that came out last year. Um, it's called The 40 Year Old Version. Um, have any of you all watched this movie or heard of this movie before? Okay. Yes, I'm seeing some people say like, yes, they've seen it or they've heard of it at least. Um, so it came out last year um, and it was kind of written, directed by, starred um, by um, Radha. And I got to remember her last name. Um, I'll look up her last name right before we when we move um, afterwards. But she um, plays this this woman who is a playwright who won a 30 under 30 award uh, in her career. And now after that first play, has kind of fallen off the radar um, and is now teaching um, pl playwright, like um, writing plays um, and acting to students in a high school. Um, and now she's approaching her, uh, her 40th birthday and is wondering what is she doing? And she doesn't want to compromise her art and who she is, but she also wants to not be forgotten and she wants to like have a legacy and she doesn't know what that, how to do that. Um, and so there's a scene that she has where she's talking to her um, agent who's a friend of hers that she's had for since childhood um, and he's trying to set up this conversation between her and a patron um, and the patron is a an older white man who does who hosts and kind of funds a lot of plays um, in, in it's in New York City um, and so I just want to show this interaction that she has with him um, and I want to kind of just for us to talk about it um, if that sounds good with everybody so I'm going to share my screen okay Um, sorry, it's like a lot of, let's see. There we go. Okay. Can you all hear that, by the way? Nope. No. Okay, I hope this isn't the same thing as Trey was dealing with last time. Um, let's see. Sarah, to, to play a video is going to be very difficult because it's going to cause the meeting to lag. Um, but you'll want to go about sharing it a different way. Uh, okay. So if you click on the share button, um, sorry, the yeah. share button at the bottom, if you click on yeah. that, mm -hmm. see where it says to. Um, You'll change it from text and images to video and sound, maybe, I think it says. I can't tell you off the top of my head because I can't see it on my screen. But if you click on the, on the, at the bottom of the screen where it says share. Yeah. You'll see where it says to change it from text and images. To oh, I see. Video. Okay. And then you'll want to share your first screen, share uh, screen number one. You see that? Sorry. Uh, um, so I'm seeing share file, share other applications, share settings, um, but I'm not share video. Okay. 
talking. Do you see it? Let's see. Let me try it again. Um, yeah, it's not showing up. Um, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, it's annoying. Um, sorry about that, y'all. Um, um, sorry when when I shared a video, I just I don't I got I don't know if it was because it was YouTube if it was just working easier, but yeah. Um, I just turned the volume all the way up on my computer and then played it out. Did you take your headphones off? Yeah, but yeah. with you playing yeah, the video, it's going to lag. Did you? Because the video playing the way she was trying to do it, the video is going to go off and screen shot. So you're not really going to see the video. Okay. You're probably not going to hear this sound because it's going to cause WebEx to slow down simply because that video is going. So WebEx okay. will start to glitch and, and stuff like that. But if she can get it shared to the way I was saying to share, it may be a little better. But if you're not seeing the option, I don't know of a different way. There's not a different way for you to share it. Um, at the top, for you. Yeah. Oh, at the top. Um, yeah, I see it on. I don't see it up here. I see the share option, but um, yeah, it's not showing the Netflix or my browser. Um. You know what? It's fine. Maybe this time we can do this next time at our next meeting and hopefully I'll work out the kinks of the video. Um, it's like not a conversation uh, you're having at our next meeting. Um, yeah. Or if like end of time, try to figure it out. Does that sound okay? Don't forget the name. Yeah, that's fine. Um, or maybe you can even send us the link. All right, I'll turn it back. Do what? I would say maybe you can send us the link via email. Yeah, I can send you the link. I can do that. Okay. Maybe we can okay. watch it that way. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Yeah, and, thank and send thank the, you. The timestamps, or if you want to, yeah, share the, yeah. the time we'll with the team. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for your efforts and going through. Um, Caroline. Hello. I will need to be able to share my screen and hopefully it will work. <laughs> um, Let's see. Can you, would you mind uh, making Caroline Vincent the presenter? Oh, sorry. Is my audio coming through? I can hear you, but I don't. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, Kenya, can you hear me? Yeah. Kenya, can you hear us? I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties right now and I may have to leave this meeting and come back into it because my computer is acting weird right now. I, no I problem. Now. I was like, Kenya, if you want to make me the host, um, I'm happy to, to keep things rolling while you uh, negotiate with your computer. Okay, I will be right back, you guys. And again, I apologize. I'm so, so, so sorry, but I don't know what's oh going on, but I think it needs to be restarted right now. And no great time to give you most privileges at this very moment. Wonderful. We've all been there, so. Okay. Okay, so Grace, do you have I sent you the link of the PowerPoint. It's in the. Yes, I think Kenya is just making me the host, and then I should be able to give you the presenter controls. Oh, okay, I got it. I didn't know if you were going to open or not, but I guess I'll do, I can talk through a little bit. Um, just from Saturday, and I had a conversation oh, um, with Paula 
about like maybe it would be a, a good thing to sort of give you guys the orientation um, talk that I give commissioners for a couple of reasons. Like one, to see like what they're hearing when they come in as new commissioners. And then two, um, just an overview of all the things that we're doing and all the things that are happening right now. And I won't, you know, go through. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I just wanted to give you the highlights and, you know, just, I mean, there may be things you don't know. There may be things you already know, but um, I just thought it might be useful at this point. So I am going to attempt to do that if we get um, the ability to show this PowerPoint. And if not, we can always do this another time. But it seems like no one. Do you still have it, Sarah? You're still the, I guess, able to share, but I don't know how to. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where our technical disconnect is coming from right now, but it is it is the virtual meeting way. Um, so thank you all for bearing with us. I don't know, Terry or Paula, if you guys want to move ahead with the agenda and we can come back to this when we if we have time, oh, wait, we have it. There you are. You just Sorry, I didn't my bad. I think I was, I think I was supposed to make you present. I don't know. I just, I saw the option. Apologies. <laughs> I don't use it. It's, it's all good. Technology, right? This is team building at its finest. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. Hooray. I don't know if it's looking different than it. Oh, wait, yeah, here's the part that I have to switch. Okay. Okay. Well, sorry, that was um, a lot of uh, preamble for not very exciting <laughs> PowerPoint that's coming your way. Um, so, obviously, you guys have seen these before. You know what the mission is. Um, this is a list of our commission right now. So, we have in, in bold. These are our most recent appointments and or reappointments. Um, so Jim Chair Schmidt, I'm sorry, Jim Schmidt as chair, and then um, Angel, I mean, Ellen Angelico, sorry, it's the end of the day, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, Reverend Dexter Brewer is new. Um, Sherry Nichols Busey was just reappointed last night. She had um, just completed part of a partial term that wasn't um, fully um, done with a previous commissioner and then David John Walker was also um, confirmed a couple of weeks ago. So these are our commissioners currently. Um, this is our staff, which many of you know. Um, we have a, about 12, give or take. We have a, a couple of interns here and there. Um, we have one vacancy, as was mentioned on Saturday. Um, and in the yellow, you see our public art team. And, and the distinction there is um, funding also so they are funded through our percent for public art budget which is a separate capital budget than our operational budget so that comes into play in, in a couple different ways um like civil service versus non-civil service and just how we are able to do certain things and so i think this is fairly self-explanatory about like who we have but we are broken up into three teams public art finance and operations and then um, janine's team with strategic funding and initiatives and then myself kind of floating there in the middle, and Emily, who um, is part-time on communications. I typically, you know, talk through all the various programs that we do um, within public art and then strategic funding and initiatives. Um, this, we talk a little bit about our budget. So you, as you can see, this lar the largest chunk of our budget is our grants money. So our, our budget is really just people you know, some office supplies and then funding that goes back out the door. Um, we do have, you know, like I said, the public art fund and then some money for public art maintenance, that kind of thing. And this is in detail, I believe, in our annual report, if you want to see more about that. Um, for those of you who don't know, we the percent for public art ordinance was adopted in 2000. And this is um, Mayor Bill Purcell signing that into action and um, since then we've added 118 artworks to the collection and I think unique for most public art collections 85% of it is by local artists which I think is cool. Um, we talked a little bit about this on Saturday in our small group about how we make decisions on public art. We get this question a lot. Um, we do or we are guided by our community investment plan um, 
the tools that are within that plan. And then also we've talked a little bit about alignment with Nashville Next, which is the city's general plan that looked at you know, neighborhood nodes in certain areas of the city that um, you know, would have certain um, characteristics. And then we also take um, requests or suggestions from council members. We um, you know, hear from other folks in the community. We also often follow capital projects that are already happening. So if a you know, library is getting built or some sort of new public facility, we're often um, attaching public art to that project. In recent years, we've also expanded into temporary public art, which I'm sure you have seen. Uh, murals, um, we've tested out some on-street murals and um, Build Better Tables, which was sort of, you know, temporary public art exhibition a couple of years ago. And Learning Lab was something we talked about on Saturday, um, is a training program for artists to, to sort of develop them into the space of civic and social practice projects. It's um, an award-winning program, and this most recent iteration in 2018 resulted in several residencies um, with Metro departments and in other nonprofits, which um, Aaron was actually one of the artists who, who worked in that. And these photos are from Kristen Chapman Gibbons' um, residency at Elizabeth Park in North Nashville. All the many programs that are within funding, including grants, Thrive, Restorative Arts, Opportunity Now, Real, and Dial. This is um, a graphic that we use quite a bit in advocacy work with you know, council and, and other community members, um, just sort of grants by the numbers. Like this is the amount of money we have going out to arts and cultural organizations, and this is what it does. Job supported student interactions with art, um, locations that are activated with art, you know, that could be anything from a community center, library, a church, or some other uh, public space. Uh, we often use this heat map that shows where all arts activities are happening, whether that be, you know, through public art, Thrive, or, or grant-funded activities. Thrive, which you, you guys are very familiar with. Um, these are just some numbers from the last uh, fiscal year. Um, lots of participation and lots of artists paid, which is, is the goal of that program. Restorative arts, which you, again, I think this group is, is familiar, is the partnership with the Juvenile Court and Detention Center. And um, this is, you know, artists working in detention and with um, youth who are impacted by the, the, the system of um, juvenile court. Opportunity Now is the program that is the Youth Employment Initiative for Davidson County, and we administer the arts placement and opportunities. So that um, application is actually open right now for host sites. And then I talk a lot about, um, you know, how we had to pivot in 2020, how everyone did, and, and sort of what were our focus areas in that space of thinking about supporting artists, um, arts organizations for survival and, you know, just economic reasons, um, you know, of course, continuing our focus on racial equity is, you know, the work that you guys are doing. And then um, the public realm, continuing, you know, public art projects. We pivoted Thrive fund funding last year to um, fund 26 artists to do virtual programs for the community. And these were meant mainly to pay artists, again, um, but we couldn't really do straight artist relief fund like a lot of organizations were doing. So we paid for projects through um, Thrive. Another program that I'm not sure we've talked much about in this space is the lending library. So we, at the beginning of all of these crises, we were like, how can we shift public art funding to local artists and sort of provide that economic relief? But also, I mean, I think this program is really exciting in that we're going to, we have commissioned or no, acquired artworks by 60 artists in Nashville, and they will be available at the lo local library branches. So you can walk in with your library card and take an artwork home, hang it up in your house for a few weeks or however long the circulation is, and bring it back and get another one. So this is launching this spring. We have the artworks in hand, we've paid the artists, and we are working on sort of the systems of display and sort of how it's going to be um, circulated throughout the libraries. And I wanted to note for, for this group that um, we the staff spent a lot of time thinking about selection for this and the public art committee also did as well is just around how can we make this the most equitable selection process possible. We had almost 50% of the artists selected are um, people of color or who identifies people of color. 
Um, 23% identified as low income, 20% or persons with disabilities, 17% seniors, 12% identified as immigrant or refugee, and 10% identified as LGBTQIA. And almost, well, I think it was 92% of these artists had not previously received funding from Metro Arts, and 73% had never applied to a Metro Arts opportunity before. So I thought that was really, you know, impactful to hear from the project managers of this, that um, that work really paid off. And, and you can see it in the numbers that um, folks were applying who we had not previously reached with our funding. Um, Madison on my mind, we've talked about a lot. This is um, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, and this was a similar process of economic relief and support to artists in this neighborhood. And that resulted in a drive through showcase that we had more than 100 cars come through on December the 12th in Madison. And I believe it was about 20 artists were paid through this project. And, and really the idea of this was also that idea of cultural mapping to sort of understand what assets are in this neighborhood and how can we support the creative, you know, groups and um, artists and, and the various creative businesses that are in that space. So this is really, I feel like, just a sampling and a beginning point of that relationship building that we talked about, um, because oftentimes we're starting in a neighborhood and, and we don't have those relationships or we don't have that connectivity that, you know, we, we know exactly what to do or, 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 you know, as Metro Arts, we even begin to think we understand a neighborhood until we've done years of work there. So I think this is just the beginning of something that will lead to much more engagement. Um, of course, at the beginning of COVID and all the various things that happened, we did a lot of resource sharing. We did a lot of surveys, um, you know, of course, trying to understand what are the top concerns for our arts organizations? How do we help them? Um, you know, I think these, these are pretty obvious things that, you know, the operating cash, revenue lost, um, fundraising challenges, all of that um, we heard over and over again. And we spent a lot of time advocating to council for additional funding. So we were able to get $2 million allocated to arts and culture from the CARES Act funding, which is that federal money. And that was released in December. Um, and then, you know, of course, the racial equity work of this committee. Um, I talk a lot about that when I'm, you know, meeting with new commissioners and just how that um, sort of manifests in the various areas of Metro Arts. Real, which I know you've, you've experienced and know a lot about, is coming back this fall. And Janine's been doing a lot of work there. Um, Dial, which you've um, heard about the leadership program and internship program. The porch program that's coming up. Um, and, and then also like continue to pivot those public art projects like um, the one Trey is working on at Cossie Gardner and really rethinking how we every time I think the staff does an amazing job every time we, you know, are starting a project to really think how can we do this differently? How can we do the deepest most authentic engagement for each project. And that means, you know, it takes a lot more time and staff capacity. And I, and I think the results, you know, you can see for yourselves, but I, these are sort of our approach to public art. Uh, certainly, we've done a lot of work this year across departmentally thinking about permitting and how can we support artists who want to do projects that maybe we're not funding, but we, you know, they need to know like Black Lives Matter came to us and like, how do we get a permit? How do we navigate that system? How do we work with Public Works? And we spent a lot of time and effort on our staff side, just, you know, making, you know, connecting those dots and translating, um, you know, permit to um, artists. And we've also created some other, you know, resource guides around mural making in Nashville and, you know, developers guide to public art, because we get a lot of questions about, you know, I want to do public art, but, but I don't know how. Um, there's a larger scale public art project coming up at the fairgrounds, and this is um, uh, some of the artists previous work. So we'll be doing a lot of um, engagement with that very soon. And then most of this what's next I talked about on Saturday. So, of course, cultural planning, strategic planning, that data analysis work and continuing our cross sector um, partnership development and thinking about, you know, that, that work, I think, it seems to be the most successful things we do is when we're working with our um, other metro departments or other partners in the community. So we will continue that. So I won't go through this whole section, but I think um, you get the idea. And this is sort of just a 
you know, skim the surface, but it gives you sort of the, um, I guess, overview of all the things that are happening. And yeah, just thought it might be helpful in this space to have that um, information. I will stop sharing my screen and happy to answer questions or if we need to move on, I can um, always answer questions later. I think if we have we have a little time for questions, if anyone has. I see there's a hand, um, Alana Renee. Hi, um, this is my first time attending a meeting and learning about your different programs. I was wondering if you could expand a little more on the dial and porch program. Yes. Um, Sure, and we can provide some follow up information on that um, directly if you would like. Um, Dial is diversity and arts leadership, so that's open to undergraduates who are from backgrounds traditionally not, you know, represented in arts administration. So um, that is open now, I want to say through February 12th, that application. And then the porch program is the um, registration has closed, but that is a writing workshop, a series of um, workshops with the porch that focus on anti-racism and also kicks off with a one day anti-racism training this weekend, I believe. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Well, Caroline, thank you so much for um, that overview. I think it is helpful even for myself to just be reminded of all the things that are happening with the commission um, on a daily basis. So thank you for that. Thank you. And now I will turn it over to Terry. Um, and oh. Trey can't unmute himself, unfortunately. Um, Kenya, are you back with us? Yes, ma'am, I am. Uh, let's see, is unmute now. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was going to ask if you don't mind um, giving me the presenter permissions. I'll bring up the PowerPoint again. Thank you. No problem. Try to look like you muted yourself again. Can you, can you speak? Yeah, sorry. No, I, I might have done that on, on purpose. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I will hand it over to, to Terry, I believe, to go over the agenda. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good word. Um, Yes, thank you. Uh, Caroline, that's that's just amazing work. Congratulations to Metro Arts and what you all are, what you have your hands in, your hands and your heart in. Um, so let's see, we're going to, Paula, do we need to back up to approving the minutes or are we deferring that? Um, we can, uh, do either or. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to review them. Um, Let's defer it then. One, okay, fantastic. I have a I have a staff update on minutes, so we can circle back around then. Okay, cool. Um, so we have our the rest of our agenda. The balance of our agenda um, is we're going to talk about um, 
setting, we're going to set the, the next meeting of the working groups. Um, we're going to talk about equity lens, which is a big goal for us to get through and hopefully finalize so we can uh, send that to commission to the commissioners. Um, some information on the strategic plan, which should lead into our organizational review, um, which I realize that's that's going to be a big chunk and will take some time over, you know, a couple, three meetings probably. And then we are down to the recommendations, um, staff update, old business, and then to the end. We'll get through, what does that time look like? We'll get through as much of this as we can. So um, we had a really good meet. Uh, I've, I heard from several folks, and I think we were all fairly, um, fairly, if not mostly, very pleased with how, with the interaction, with the accommodation by Metro Arts and your tech team. You did an amazing job um, from the participants, and just the engagement and the goal setting was was very nice to see. We made some really good progress. So thank you all for joining us. Um, so we need to figure out when the next working group meet is going to be. Um, we the last one we had was on the third Wednesday, I believe. So I just we need to kind of figure out if that's going to work. If that's okay. Do we want to keep it there? Do we want to do something different? Um, and let's let's pick a date and get that locked in. So, yes, no. What do we want to do? Is third Wednesday? Okay, I like. Yes. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say I like the way we've had it historically. I mean, just how we've been doing it. The third, third Wednesday, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, like that's worked, and we have that time allocated. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, um, it, any? But, yeah. Any other, other thoughts? Um, I did just want to check in and sort of see how um, y'all would like staff to show up in these working groups. Um, it was really fantastic. I know I was bouncing in between on Saturday, but it was really fantastic to hear y'all's discussions and be a part of that. Um, so I'm I'm happy to participate in, in whatever way um, would be useful to y'all. And but I wasn't sure how that how that um, how staff sort of worked into the working group flow. Um, and I think, I mean, we you know during the retreat, we had everyone. I think your voice is valuable. Um, you all's voice is valuable. So unless there's something prohibitive to it, oh, um, no. we may have to talk no. about logistics. Um, and whether it's a publicly noticed kind of thing or not, but uh, I mean, this is there. I'd like to hear other discussion about um, how to work that out, or if there's a a deterrent to working that out. Um, so I want yes. to say that. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I I was going to say I'm. I'm happy to, I guess, commit to being a part, you know, being there every time for the internal analysis group, just kind of, you know, having consistency. And if something comes up where I don't need to be present, um, then obviously we'll kind of have notice and time ahead to say, hey, you, you might need to step back for this one. But, um, if you all can be comfortable with that, that's, that's probably a good happy medium. Um, other care team members want to chime in on that? Aaron has his hand raised. Okay, I can't see your hand, Aaron. You have to unmute your, oh, you can't, he's muted. Can someone unmute Aaron, please? There we go. I was permanently <laughs> muted. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any. Big thoughts. I just wasn't able to share any of them. Um, uh, that that third Wednesday it, that works well for me. I, um, but that that was kind of all I had to say. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And my my only my only thing I would jump in. This is Jonathan. Just say I think it's really important for the staff to be part of these conversations, given that the staff are the ones actually executing the work of the commission. 
Um, and so I want to be mindful of that vis-a-vis -vis, like the time being asked of them and make sure that that works. But I just, you know, I think it's really important that we're working in partnership with partnership with, with them as much as possible. Hey, this is Janine. Um, yeah, I'm happy to um, continue working on the working groups. Um, I participated in the external partnerships group uh, during the retreat. Um, just one logistics uh, question or um, topic to, to work out is, um, if um, happy to do just one, but if needed, like I know that some uh, some folks are, you know, kind of are are on two or multiple, or it would be appropriate for um, some people to kind of um, you know to participate um, on multiple, you know, given the certain you know the month or the topic that's being discussed. And so I just wonder in the scheduling if. Um, you know, if we could just stagger the time so that it is possible if if necessary um, for those, you know, like maybe there's a five o'clock start for one and a six o'clock start for the other. Um, just for those for those times when multiple group um, participation is is appropriate. We, we can we can certainly do that um, the way we did the the first one was like what we did. Um, we modeled. The one during the retreat after that, where we found a midpoint and swapped kind of like working group speed dating. Um, and so it can, uh, we can try it. Uh, the way you tested it was just the staggered time. What's important though is to make sure we have time at the end for the groups to come back together to report out to each other. So, um, but we can certainly. Try it, and you know we we're fluid with it. I think I think we kind of need to be, and I think that's fine. Um, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So Janine, thank you. We can uh, we can. I don't know. I'll I'll poll um, members and see which one is is the the most comfortable to accomplish that. Um, anyone else? We had talked about um, coming back to these meetings and reporting out uh, on the working groups. Would that be would that be the time that we could come back to report out rather than kind of recongregating after the meetings? Well, thoughts on that? I think that the advantage to doing it at the end of our working group session, the whole meeting session, is because we can come back in the community. And discuss, and then we still report out during the care meeting. But that is, you know, I'm not ruled. So what it's really just what we're comfortable with and what's effective. Um, other thoughts around whether we report out at the end of our session, because if, if we do the separate times, it would make it a little longer, um, or how we've done it previously. Either way. Okay. I like the idea of reporting out during our care meetings so that we have record and it's recorded in the minutes. I think we would do that anyway. Aaron, were you suggesting, help me uh, maybe understand, were you suggesting not reporting out at the end of the working group sessions and only reporting out during care? I think, I think as one option um, and that if, you know, if, if we do it that way, that might give us a little bit more flexibility for the working groups to, to schedule their own times together. I know with, you know, with a couple, with pe some people in a couple of different groups, um, it might make it a little complicated, you know, to ensure that we have enough time uh, to talk through because like in our during the retreat, I feel I feel like we, you know, the working group that I'm a part of, we took up that whole time. And I know that there are some other folks who um, who are part of other working groups that uh, maybe didn't end up um, joining those other groups because of our the conversation that we were having. And so um, I just didn't know if uh, you know, allowing those separate times 
without without the need to kind of recongregate af afterwards might give us a little bit more flexibility to ensure that we we all have enough time to have those conversations um i don't know just a thought i'm i'm definitely open and, and flexible to other, to other ideas yeah no that makes sense. um and we can we can do it you know, uh try it that way next meeting. and um and that's that's fine uh that's fine to try. Other thoughts? I guess I'll echo what Aaron, like I like the idea of us having a placeholder time for for um, our committee meetings. And then, I don't know, maybe just playing it by ear and seeing how much time is actually necessary for each meeting. And like maybe we just try it out the next time, trying to make everything happen. And if that doesn't work, then kind of allowing people to schedule their own based on people's availability per each committee. Um, but I do like that we have that time allotted um, for committees to meet. Um, and I personally, I like both. I like the reporting out at the end of that meeting because it I feel like it lets us close out in a meaningful way. And then we feel kind of <laughs> inspired to move forward together. But I do get that maybe it does take up time in which we could be doing that kind of reporting out in a care meeting. So, um, but I think it's more streamlined when we report out here in the care meeting versus like kind of processing together. Um, like we did last time um, in our committee meeting kind of report outs. So it's just, I really didn't offer, uh, I don't know. I, I'm of both ways. So <laughs> that's, that's fine. That's fine. Other thoughts? I believe John is yeah trying to unmute himself. Is that correct, John? Yes. Okay. There, if we could unmute John. Uh, I I, I I'm echoing what Sarah said, but I do find I I find it useful to also report back within the uh, within the Wednesday meetings because if you're not in the sessions with the other with the other groups, you don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's like you know, it's two weeks before you get that information, and that information. You could actually, we could do more work with it, or you know what I'm saying, or we can understand how to support it better before we hear it in the care meeting. That's that's my only concern. Okay, Tanya, I agree. Yeah, I just echo what John said. I think we can build off of each other. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, other thoughts on it? Okay, um, so let me let me think about that, um, and I will you know I'll reach out to a handful of folks and just kind of what or schedule I'm moving towards um, bounce it off of of them, and um, and find something comfortable. We'll try it, and if we need to adjust, we'll adjust. Um, but we'll not with our working group meetings in in one format or the other, um, if that's okay All right, with with everyone. I did want to say I saw Alana, Elena's um, hand up. I don't know if that's from before or if that's for this conversation. Okay, I can't, those hands are so small, I can't see. So yes, who, Elena, did you, would you like to chime in? It was from before, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, no problem. All right, so um, however we, at the meeting, the next third Wednesday is February 17th. And we typically start um, about uh, it's 5 to 6.30 is generally what the time is. So um, we can pencil in that 17th and uh, get that um, Zoom link out. Um, and unless there's further discussion, I think that's that disposal agenda item. Um, next is the equity lens uh, tool that we started looking at during the retreat. So if everyone has their copy, um, Paul, you, you polled the group and got notes. Did, how would you like to, how do you suggest we start to walk through this? 
I only received notes from Megan. Thank you, Megan. They were very, very helpful and thorough. And that was more from the working group conversation. The items that I picked up when we were at the retreat or during our retreat, I can pull those up. There were some other questions that um, popped up and some of the questions were in re Regards to the first equity lens question from the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, what I heard from everybody was who are the groups historically included and excluded um, from this policy program practice decision or action, and what are the potential impacts on these groups? Um, so it's kind of the same, but it's more, you know, the groups that are historically included or and excluded. Um, who will be harmed by this policy, program, practice, decision, or action? Who is missing from this work? Are we making relationships before making offers of help? How are we intentionally involving stakeholders through the entire process? And who are we serving and how are we serving them? So those were the notes that I took from Saturday. And based on the conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that all five questions or all one, the first question? Is that representative it's, of all five? I want to say we didn't go through all five and we kind of just stayed within um, the first couple. Okay. Okay, okay so um, who is, who's missing, who's underrepresented? Okay. <clears throat> who are the groups historically included and excluded for this policy, program, practice, decision, or action? And then the second part are what are the potential impacts on these groups? The second question that popped up was who will be harmed by this policy, program, practice, decision, or action? The third one was who is missing from this work? Are we making relationships before making offers of help? How are we intentionally involving stakeholders through the entire process? And who are we serving and how are we serving them? Okay. And that was, I remember, we were all engaged in this and that's just kind of what I wrote down. Yes. Yeah. And that this actually does kind of span all five. Um, so, terminology. If we, with with what we have discussed and what Paula has just read and what we're seeing on um, on our screens, let's just go. Let's just work on the first question. Terminology wise, this fit what we want Metro Arts to be able to use as an equity lens. And if not, or if there's adjustment, what words do we need to adjust? We just need to come come to a consensus on this this first question. So we we should be able to brainstorm through this a little bit. It, it, it's are you are you asking about the question as it's stated currently, or the version that we have that we worked out about underrepresented and historically underrepresented and represented? That's just a clarification. Well, a, a little of both. So we have the question in front of us, which has a form to it. So because what Paula read is is it, it's it is a question or is it all five questions? So we need to let's take the first question and formulate that. Change the wording here that we see, um, so that we finish this one question, the first question. So who's who's missing? Who's historically excluded, um, harmed, relationships before offers, uh, include stakeholders. So how do we want to word this first question? I wanted to uh, ask uh, Megan, I, I remember during our retreat, Megan brought up a really great way of kind of describing these groups. I can't remember the exact terminology. This is Megan. Um, the point that I was making when we were talking about 
underrepresented versus like in thinking about language was to um, kind of approach it in the same way um, you do like with sociology practice or anthropology where you don't say subcultures um, because that implies, you know, superiority, inferiority, you say co-cultures. And so for me, like rather than saying underrepresented, because I think that that takes a very specific viewpoint that doesn't look at the vibrancy of the community as it exists with outside, um, outside of Metro um, perspective. And instead, I, I really urge us to find um, either different language or considering dropping necessarily underrepresented programs or sorry, un underrepresented groups and question more like who's not at the table. Does that help clarify? Yeah, it does for me. Um, I, and I like that and kind of saying, kind of combining what was already kind of mentioned around maybe who are the historically, um, what are the groups, who are the groups affected by this policy program, blah, 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 that are, have been historically not at the table or not involved in decision making or something like that, and, and or currently not involved in decision making. Like, that's really what it's about, right? I mean, like, have they been involved in that process or, I don't know, or they're impacted by that, by the decisions that are being made without them. So from from that conversation, who are the co-cultures affected by this, blah, 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 um, and who have historically been excluded? Does that say enough? I think you should, think you should add um, who have not been the decision making part. I think that's important. Actually, now I'm saying maybe that's number three. <laughs> they all kind of merge together, but um, have you intentionally involved stakeholders? Maybe that's more decision-making question. Mm -hmm. It could be both, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually think we, we kind of walked through all five without stopping to say we're on question whatever. Um, so again, for the first one, who are, who are the co-cultures affected by this, whatever it is, um, and have his and who has historically excluded um, in the list is that enough um, differently i was just say, i uh, like me cannot remember who brought it up but um someone at the treat mentioned like uh expanding it to um historically included and excluded so we're recognizing those who have had input and those who have not. Okay. Um, and forgive me, whoever brought that up. I am, I am having some quarantine brain. I agree with that, this Ellen, um, because sometimes the way it's phrased, I can see groups that have been served and had a voice for all these years saying that changes are going to harm them, right? So if we emphasize um, who's been excluded, making sure they're at the table, and who's consistently been included throughout the mission's existence, it'll kind of help and give us a better picture of who's really been excluded, if that makes sense. Okay, so who are the co-cultures affected by this? Who has been included and excluded? from and the list. Third part of that question is, uh, what are the potential impacts on these groups? And that's where I think we have to have the discussion that to get equity, sometimes traditionally served organizations or groups might have to give up a little in order to give equity to all and to share resources, et cetera. Is that something we want to formulate in this question? Yeah. I don't feel like that's something that necessarily needs to be, be a part of 
of this question, but it's, uh, I think it's something that we need to have that we need to think about and have and have an answer for for when that question comes up. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah just keep in mind that the, the framework for this is um, Metro Arts will use this tool in meetings and conversations in order to set um, the, you know, use the lens in order to set their minds to the work that needs to be done. So what we have so far is who are the co-cultures affected by this? Who has historically been included and excluded from? And what are the potential impacts on these groups? Is that enough? Is that clear? Does it say what we want to say? I think that's useful as a first part of an evaluation process. So yeah, I think that's very effective. Okay. Okay. Terry, could we, I mean, once we kind of get a, a draft of this um, starting point, could we, could it then be sent out to all of us to maybe noodle on and add comments and stuff if necessary? Yes. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Um, okay, so we can and just set that to the side. This, it's a good start. We can go to number two. Number two is does the policy program practice blah, 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 or action worsen existing disparities or produce their unintended consequences? Does that is that stand as is or do we want to wordsmith that one? I, I don't know. I feel like language obviously is really important and the word the the word disparities, I don't think it's getting at like the root of what we're trying to look at. It's really about like inequities or injustices. Um and are those being worsened? So I would I would kind of like advocate for change and taking out disparities and putting in inequities or injustices or something that's a little stronger. Or or do we I mean in dealing with white supremacy, we're acknowledging that harm has been done. So are we moving in the place where um, in the affirmative, we want to talk about repairing harm? Just a question. John, I would, I would say my first thought was changing it to does this program cause harm was just kind of that as a basic question. Um, and maybe there's more added on, but I, when you said that term harm was definitely a word that connected with me in that. So does this blah, blah, blah cause harm? Is that enough? Just that concise statement? And how so? Would we want to, <laughs> would we want to include a, uh, something affirmative like cause or repair harm to give to give some thought to some of that, some of that repair work that needs to happen. That's yeah, I think that's Aaron. a good point. Yeah. I'm looking at um, another tool that's kind of similar um, from Multnomah County, um, and they use language like uh, what processes are traumatizing. Um, oh wait, wait, hold on, sorry. Are people traumatized or re-traumatized by blah, 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 the decision policy program? Um, so maybe that, I don't know, that's just a suggestion again around maybe being more specific on what harm is being caused or is it harm that is being, is it being perpetuated again and again? Um, yeah. I do think it's, sorry, I do think it's also important to keep the unintended part in the, in the question because I feel like it's deeper than just like, oh, I didn't mean to, to cause harm or we, we had good intentions, um, but kind of challenging to think a little deeper. Yeah, I was wondering about about keeping keep it, maybe putting that as its own question of what are the unintended consequences? Because I feel like there are always unintended consequences um, just as a prompt to kind of think through some of those things. Okay, 
So two stands at does this uh, cause or repair harm? Uh, the second question is, what are the unintended consequences? Do those stand on their own merits? Okay. Um, I mean, go ahead. Oh, before we before we move on, and this is a question I would love feedback. Is there something to be said for maybe keeping? Cause or repair harm, comma, worse than existing existing inequities and injustices, comma, and or traumatize or re-traumatize. Um, I mostly asked just because it felt like there's like a, a center of this question, but maybe phrasing it in the different ways will speak to different the different ways people think. Or is it better just to keep it simple? Um what was the last, what was the third one? Uh, cause or repair? Oh, uh, worsen or what was the, the traumatized part? Oh, uh, Sarah had brought up that uh, language she'd seen was does this policy program traumatize or re traumatize? Okay. Um, okay, so does this blah, 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 cause or repair harm? Worsen existing inequities or injustices, traumatize or re traumatize as a question. Um, yes, but I would love feedback on whether it, it needs to have all of those or if it's okay just to be the simple cause or repair harm. Mm -hmm. Maybe after what you said, Terry, instead of say or produce other intended consequences such as re-traumatizing individuals, something simpler like that. I mean, keep everything, cause harm or repair, worsen existing inequities or produce other intended consequences such as the trauma. Mm -hmm. But I also would say, like, we do want to think tangibly what like we want people to think tangibly about what the unintended consequences might be. So, like, yeah, I think the trauma is, is like the tangible, but then what is like the maybe material consequences also of the decision that that could be wrong, like lack of access to grant. Like, how do we make sure that that's not lost to um, and the unintended consequence part of the question? I don't think it is, but that's I just want to down, kind of pull it up. It's down in number four about the barriers. Oh. Funding, programmatic. Okay, so two stands at does this uh, cause or repair harm, worsen existing inequities or injustices, or produce unintended consequences such as trauma, uh, trauma, or or how do we put that? Traumatize, traumatization or re-traumatization? That's all very long word consequences such as perpetuating trauma, I don't <laughs> deepening trauma. I mean, maybe it's like parentheses, uh, produce other unintended consequences, parentheses, financial, uh, mental, emotional, uh, I don't know, just like, like, so people are thinking about the different kinds of ways consequences could show up as a result of these decisions. Yeah, you could pull the parentheses from number four up to it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, is that including trauma or replacing trauma? The parentheses. I would say that trauma would be included under emotional, but um, but there's I don't think there's harm in calling it out specifically. Okay. Okay, 
So does this cause or repair harm or existing inequities or injustices produce or produce unintended consequences such as mandated political, emotional, financial, programmatic, or managerial? What do we want to put at the end of that? Or, or are we saying or cause where to go? trauma such as, and then that list of tangibles? Yeah, I like that, Terry. Like it's a, what you said. Yeah, I like the such as too. Okay. So that's two, three, and I'm trying to keep up with our time here. Um, so we're at 613 and we have a strategic plan and organizational review. Okay. So uh, do we want to make break it here and these out wordsmith by um, conversation and email and move on to the strategic plan RFQ? Or do we want to just finish this? Because that's probably all the time we'll have. I'll say work on this if we don't really have time for the other two, right? Is that a cons consensus? I'd say we finish this so then we can actually check it off the list. And then um, Grace sent out the RFQ today, and I don't even know that anybody's had a chance to read it. So ah. it may just be that we stay with this. OK. Um, OK, so. Uh, case then number three how have you intentionally involved stakeholders who are also members of the communities affected by the policy all, all that can you validate your assessments in one and having considered stakeholder reaction does this stand i have questions I that... go ahead go ahead um, I was just going to say, I think it should be called out like the involvement of the stakeholders needs to be throughout the entire process. Um, from initial planning to, uh, you know, through the end of whatever, whatever it is that is that is being whatever action or decision or whatever. I think it needs to specifically be throughout the entire process. Okay, um, remembering that we're asking Metro Arts to look at what they're doing with this lens, we're st saying that um, stakeholders should be participative, should be participants through the entire process of what they're doing, or just as a general phil philosophical statement. I think that comes. I, Go ahead. I feel like that comes down to comes down to relationship building and building a relationship before before offering help of some sort or, um, you know, I think that relationship needs to be there and part of that relationship is involving is involving community members in conversations, you know, long before, uh, long before a program is developed um because you're not going to really know how to serve the community until you know what the community needs uh and so i, th I think it's just kind of important that 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 relationship start early on okay i think i think what would help us hone these better which we can't do tonight but would be to take a policy or a program of metro arts 
and look at that one through the these five lens these five lens questions and see how the questions actually apply in a real life situation and it might help us hone the language better as to how it would help metro arts to guide their policies and practices and program development Ellen, I really like that idea. Testing it to see if it works and then yeah. fixing it as how as needed. Yeah. To fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is Janine same. I really I think that'll be great and really productive. Yep, I agree. And that's a great idea. Okay. Um off the top of our heads, any particular program? Staff, do you have a suggestion <laughs> of a policy or program practice? I think um, this is Caroline. I mean, I'm thinking about Thrive as that came up as an example on Saturday. And I feel like it's something we're kind of, you know, uh, noodling on exactly what the direction is for the future. And we've had a graduate student doing a lot of research and talking to artists. And I, I don't know, it, it, that comes to mind. I'm sure there are other programs, but um, and or, you know, if there's a public art project or something that's a little, you know, smaller, smaller in scope. So you can really kind of drill drill down. Um, that would be my suggestion. I was thinking, like, I guess one of the processes similar to the lending library is good because we're connecting with so many community artists, um, and kind of that's targeted to a broad group of people. I don't know if if anyone else kind of agrees not to. I know that's kind of specific, but overall, looking at the framework of just the public art selection could be. Um, It'd be nice not to, um, you know, just to to see the nuance of the kind of, you know, the two different teams. I know we do a lot of cross agency work now, but they are kind of different processes that we've identified. And, you know, like, well, yeah, how using this framework in the development of, of a funding program like Thrive and then also in the selection process of like a public art thing. I think that's really, I mean, that's, yeah, that, that would be really good work. Yeah, like looking, looking at, did you select art that would appeal to the audience that frequents, say, the Southeast Library? You know what I mean? When you chose the art libraries, what is it, Madison, Madison, the Southeast? Mm -hmm. Did you take into consideration the communities that actually use those um, libraries and are they represented in the artists and the artwork that was chosen to be part of that lending? I mean, that's one lens. I think it's important that we look at a policy as well. So not just programs, but maybe so I'm thinking back to when Caroline just gave us her presentation and she showed us the staff um, org chart. And so we had public art on one side, we had the strategic funding or strategic initiatives in Janine on this side, and then maybe something from that middle piece, which is more policy related. Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I would just throw out there, I mean, if we really wanna drill down, one of the issues we had with that particular program was getting artists paid and so you run into like artists moving around a lot or they don't have a bank account or, you know, there's just a lot of different things happening there. And then the, we run up against sort of the Metro's payment system. So that's just one sort of tactical piece where it's just like, okay, well, we're trying to do this thing and we're trying to pay artists, but then it becomes onerous because of all of the bureaucracy. And so I, I know that's a lot of the work that Ian and his team does is just trying to get folks paid and get checks out the door, which is sometimes really hard to, you know, so I think there's a lot of different ways we could drill down and into the various aspects of, you know, any project. Okay, is that well, uh, we need to hone in on something simple, I think, to, to be able to go through them all. So maybe we hone in on something like um, how 
we, how we reach out to artists for Thrive or for the lending, how we how we promote it, how we reach out, how wide is our net to be sure that the community, you know, the entire community of artists from whatever cultures, whatever, know that the opportunity even exists. Maybe just honing in on some simple policy like that. Uh, the mechanics of something simple like that, um, just to go through all five questions and look at one thing before we like branch out to others. So that gives us uh, three. We have um, three programs, Thrive Public Art Lending Library. We have a policy to review and a tactical question to review. I think that's a really good start. And we have three questions we have seeded um, as S E E D E D um, with thoughts on how we can form these questions appropriately and have them reflect on Metro Arts. I think that's uh, other thoughts? I like that. Uh, I just have a, Go ahead. I just have a logistical question. I do. I love this idea. Um, I think it's fantastic. I just want to. Um, I just want to make sure that staff is able to get you all the information. That y'all would need. Um, without it being like a deluge. Um, so I don't know what the what the best process for how we share that information, or if you know we can get feedback about okay, we'd like to see these things so that we can sort of look through the equity lens, um, so we can provide y'all with what you need. Uh, can can you put documents? We've got the SharePoint site, right? Mm -hmm. So is it, I mean, is it that simple as just putting the documentation out there, letting us know, and then we uh, go review? We'll have a meeting, right, the next meeting, this will be part of that to discuss. Like, do you have written policies on how artists are notified about opportunities, um, that kind of stuff? I, I would have to jump in and say, I don't think this is going to be something we can just hand you documents. I mean, a lot of it is just work that the staff are doing in verbal conversations and phone calls. And I mean, we don't have policies around necessarily like, okay, we always do it this way because it's always um, specific. It's site specific or community specific plans. So I, I would think if we want to go through this process, it might just need to be like a working session with all the staff that are involved. And we can certainly provide you know, documents in advance that we have, but I would think we just need to all be jumping in and say, you know, you guys asking questions and then sort of talking it through. I, I just, I don't know. I mean, we could try it. I just, I'm, I'm worried you'll miss a whole big part of the work if we just, at what's not written down and that's probably part of the work of this committee is getting to the policies but i'm gonna i'm looking at trey i don't i don't i don't know if that's exactly yeah. something we can i guess i would imagine like for for public art the thing that really guides it would be the public art guidelines and and that's so that's kind of but it's that but the public art guidelines are also not specific so we i mean we could go through a call to artists but it it would probably be helpful to have like an introduction I, I'd agree just to kind of figure out where to start and then going from there um, you know we could provide documentation I don't know if that I guess that's similar to what Caroline was saying but um. I mean uh, um, I think I think that's helpful to know and I think I don't think I mean at least I wasn't anticipating we were just going to look at documents um, and kind of come up with conclusions or see if this works but I think it's helpful for us to know that part of this like lens will require both looking at documentation and also talking to staff members um, about processes that are happening or have just kind of been happening and have not maybe written been written down 
Um, and then, you know, I think that also helps then you all at Metro Arts, like thinking about sustainability and like making sure information isn't lost, like what actually needs to be documented for regular review and then what, you know, needs to be shifted and changed based on like this lens, you know, moving forward. Because it really is like a quality improvement tool at some degree too. It's like, how do we improve the processes and make them more racially just as well? You know, given our time, and I, I definitely agree with that. I think that we could even continue to wordsmith these questions as a committee, but then staff, maybe you guys should come into agreement into what would be one of the easier ways for us to look to see whether or not this works, the equity lens works. So that could be learning labs, it could be Thrive, it could be the project Trey's working on at the park. I mean, it could be a number of different things. And I think it's, let's figure out what allows us to take the deepest dive with minimum effort, minimal effort, if that makes sense. So that we're not just staring at a lot of documents. I don't know, what do you guys think about that? I, I think I think that's a good idea. I, I don't know that it's necessarily minimal effort, but more specificity will help us. Mm -hmm. I just think that that's where we're at. And I think one, if we take one program, I think filtering through that program will get us to how artists are and community is reached out to, and how artists are paid. I think we can fold those two things into just the analysis of the program itself. And how communities are involved, right? Yes. It's what the lens is designed to do. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and then we can even look at once we've finalized these questions via email or however, um, we can hand these questions to them and so then they can see, okay, this particular program or this particular, whatever that one is, go through it and then they can walk us through the process um, of how they got there and then we can identify any gaps or um, any areas where we need to, where we feel it needs to be more highlighted or maybe the wording wasn't right, just whatever that looks like. Just kind of do a trial run. And I think that would add um that would give it a strong foundation and then when we when it goes to the commissioners we can um say that this has already happened this is kind of we went through the process and it works as opposed to still questions right that we vetted it and that it made sense we had a couple reiterations but then we came back together and said yes Thoughts? Does that make sense? Does that sound, is that reasonable? Yeah. That's, that sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, so that gets us through the, the first point. We, did, we haven't finalized it, but it gets us down to that, um, that point of finalizing the questions, which we're going to do. We can defer, define implementation, because um, that will be part of the process we're going to embark, and then the recommendation will come after that. Um, it is 631, so um, I would like to, um, we'll need to defer strategic plan and organizational review. I would like to, if we can consider um, item E, recommending to the commission that we um, have the care retreat update, update to the commissioners, by Paula and Will at the next meeting, and that we ask that care be a permanent part of the commission's commissioners meeting. Do we have time to deliberate on those or should we defer that to the next meeting as well? Well, I will definitely be providing a update to the commission regarding our retreat and even what we're doing this evening um, on the, I think our meeting is on the 18th. And then um, I'll do that. The only, um, I definitely think here, obviously I'm partial, we should be on the agenda every month, but I will say that because of COVID, a lot of the agenda items are only action items. And so 
Um, but staff, you guys can speak to this more than I can. So I don't know how we'll be able to do it, but I think we can definitely, um, and the, the way we're going, we're probably gonna have action items monthly anyway to take to the commission. So it may not even be an issue. I think we can, um, I don't wanna speak out of turn, but I feel like the original, um, on the action items has loosened slightly. So I think in this case, we could just say it's a report out from the committee. The action item is requesting that it be a part of the agenda. And then that becomes more official. And then we can sort of each month decide, you know, what what that agenda item looks like. And, you know, a lot of the work we do and we're trying to do with this committee too, is through a report prior to the meeting so we can have all that narrative, uh, you know, that doesn't have to be covered in a meeting. So we can, you know, just decide like what, what goes to them in advance as a report, what is, a, you know, needs to be a discussion action item in the meeting. And it might be different each month, but we can certainly try. Thank you. Um, and I do think that our, I do think that Metro Legal has been widening, widening the uh, interpretation of Executive Order 71 just as we get more into this. But I think it's certainly something, it makes sense, it seems reasonable. So I agree with Paula and Caroline. And maybe, so what I can do for the group, for the committee then, um, I will probably ask you, what do you want me to report out? Like, what should we, I can draft an outline, but then I would like for input from everyone so that I'm representing um, the entire group and not just one or two individuals. Thoughts from the group? I can get behind that. Yes. Me too. This is our. Me three. Yep, I support it. Behind here. Thank you. Megan? That works for me. Okay. I think that's consensus. Thank you all. I will send an email that says, what do you want me to share with the commission this month? And just whatever it is, reply all or just reply to me. Either way, it doesn't matter, but I'll compile it and then I'll send it back to everybody so that you have an understanding of that, that you know that I have an understanding of what it is that you've offered and that we're all clear. Thank you, Paula. Um, so we have reached the end of our agenda. Uh, oh, sorry, we haven't. Um, so shall we defer the remainder next full meeting? Does staff any have any updates that they need to share with us before we go? Um, I believe it's all in the report. Um, we we're just going to highlight a couple of things, but I think the report can speak for itself. And thank you guys for doing the report. I think it's very helpful. Um, I know we had a tight turnaround time with the retreat on Saturday to today, so materials came out a little bit late, but. I think that that's a good way for us to just kind of know what's going on and then if we have questions. And so um, if you haven't had a chance to read the report, please do so. And if you have any questions, please reach out to every staff person's name is on there. So you can reach out to directly. Hugely impactful. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. You want me to do my thing, Tara? Do your thing, Paula. Um, oh, so our next meeting is scheduled for March 3rd from 5 to 6.30. If you will add that to your calendar. 
Um, is there any other business of the body that needs to be tended to this evening? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned at 6.37 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you all. See you next time. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.